what, what God does through His Word is He gives us joy. He gives us joy. Look at verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. This is metaphor. This is imagery that's meant to draw our mind that when the psalmist is reading God's Word, he's saying, it's better than having my favorite sweet at the end of the day. How wonderful your words taste to me. This is imagery that's helping us see the joy that God gives us through His Word. Another word for joy is happiness. Look me in the eye. Do you want to be happy? I do. I want to be happy according to the truth. By God's grace, you want joy? You want happiness? The psalmist is saying, you get it here. That's how God gives it to you. Jeremiah the prophet says it like this, Your words were found and I ate them. And your words have become to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Hear me, I'm not saying the Scriptures should produce joy. I'm saying if you are in Christ, God will produce joy in you if you give yourself to His Word. Will, not should, will. If you, have, if you say you're a Christian and you are joyless, first question I'm going to ask you, how serious do you take the written Word of God? Do you study it? Do you dig in the mines to discover the gold? Do you meditate upon it? I'm a, I can almost always draw a straight line there. When you suffer, are you despairing utterly? When people don't like you or reject you, does that really destroy you? Almost always, our lack of joy can go straight to, are you in the Word? Are you saturated with what God says? God will give you joy in it. He'll show you, it doesn't really matter if other people don't like me. God smiles at me. I'm okay. When we suffer, we go, you know what? God says, I am intricately working in all things for my glory and your good forever, even the terrible things. I'm okay. He gives us joy. Why? Honestly, it's not just, oh, God tells me to keep the Sabbath day holy. Oh, that makes me happy. Well, yeah. But more than anything, God gives us joy in the Scripture because the entirety of the Scripture is about Jesus. There is not a single page in your Bible that is not promising foreshadowing, or making us long for Jesus, or just flat out explicitly explaining Him and His good news and what He's doing to redeem a people for Himself. The entirety of the Scriptures is about Jesus, and that's the prime reason that as we give ourselves to the study of the Word, joy is going to increase because you're going to constantly be drawn back by God, and He's going to teach you, give you wisdom and understanding, hate your sin, as you see Jesus more and more clearly, and as you're just reminded of Him and His excellencies. The whole Bible is about Him, friends. It's about Jesus, the one who left His throne for earth below to save a wretch like me. The Bible's about Jesus, the one who faced every temptation I have faced, and said no to sin every time, and yes to his Father, yes to the perfect law of God and righteousness. The whole Bible is about Jesus, the one who, though perfect in every way, humbled himself 
even to the point of death on a cross. That's what the Scriptures are about. And on the cross, Jesus didn't taste words from heaven sweeter than honey. On the cross, Jesus tasted the bitter cup of the wrath of God for you and I that we deserve. He took the bitterness so that we could get the sweetness from God's Word as He teaches us more and more about Jesus. Jesus took that bitter cup of wrath so that we could be given the cup of God's salvation, so that we could read things like this in Psalm 119, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth, because the whole scripture is about the Jesus who took the bitter cup away from me and drank it in my place. Friends, give yourself to the study, to the meditation, to the memorization, and to the keeping of God's Word. In any book of the Bible you read, see the truth. In Genesis, Jesus is the son of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb slain so that the Lord's people can be spared the justice they deserve. In Leviticus, Jesus is our true high priest, offering a better sacrifice and a better holy of holies than any other priest could offer. In the book of Numbers, Jesus is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, leading his people to the promised land. In Deuteronomy, Jesus is the prophet like Moses, whom we must listen to or we will perish forever. In Joshua, Jesus is the captain of the Lord's army, making war on his enemies. When we ask him, who are you for, me or my enemies? Jesus says with a sword drawn, no, I'm for myself. But if you're with me, you're going to be good. In Judges, Jesus is the judge we long for to correct our rebellious hearts. In Ruth, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, Jesus is our trusted prophet, revealing God perfectly to us. In Kings and Chronicles, Jesus is the king we long for, who will not abandon us, who will rule righteously forever. In Ezra, Jesus is the rebuilder of broken down walls of the city of God. In Esther, Jesus is the one who doesn't simply risk his life, but who gives his life to save his people. In Job, Jesus is our ever-living Redeemer. In Psalms, Jesus is the Son we must kiss or perish. And he is the Good Shepherd who ends up laying down his life for his sheep. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Jesus is the very embodiment of wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, Jesus is the church's loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the gospel preacher proclaiming good news to the poor, the year of the Lord's favor, and he's also at the same time the suffering servant of the Lord who is willingly crushed by the Father to make a people righteous for himself. In Jeremiah, Jesus is the righteous branch. In Lamentations, Jesus is the better weeping prophet who doesn't simply weep for sin, but kills sin by letting himself be killed in the place of sinners. In Ezekiel, Jesus is the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, Jesus is the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. He's the one who closes the lion's mouths for Daniel, and he is the son of man given an eternal kingdom that will never end after his ascension. In Hosea, Jesus is the faithful husband forever married to the harlot. In Joel, Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, Jesus is our true burden bearer. In Obadiah, Jesus is the one mighty to save. In Jonah, Jesus is the better one that was thrown into the sea of God's wrath so that all those on board would be spared. 
In Micah, Jesus is the messenger with beautiful feet. In the book of Nahum, Jesus is the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, Jesus is God's evangelist. In Zephaniah, Jesus is our Savior. In Haggai, Jesus is the restorer of the Lord's lost heritage. In Zechariah, Jesus is the fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. He's the priest that stands with dirty clothes so that we can be clothed with righteousness. In Malachi, Jesus is the sun rising of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In the gospel accounts, Jesus is the God-man come to save sinners by grace. In Acts, we see what Jesus continued to do the first 30 years after he ascended to heaven. All the letters of the New Testament clarify who he is, what his gospel means, how we should live for him, and how to watch out for those who teach contrary to his prophets and apostles. In Revelation, Jesus is our coming king. He will slay men who refuse to come to him through faith and remain in their sins. He will perfect his people who trust him by faith, and he will perfect the entire world world. He's the coming king who has promised, I will make everything new. Do not give yourselves to the reading of the word just to learn grammar. Give yourselves to the word of God and see Jesus on every page. Friends, the first time Jesus came to the earth about 2,000 years ago, He came to slay sin in men. And as A.W. Pink said, the second time he comes, he's coming to slay men who are still in their sin. When Jesus comes back, will you be found as one who looks to the scriptures alone and trusts simply in the clear Jesus who died and rose in place of sinners? You, if you remain on your own, if you remain dependent on anyone or anything outside of Jesus and what he's done, you will be cut in half. We will get the judgment and wrath we deserve, but if you flee to Jesus with a simple faith, trusting in this one that the whole Bible's about, he says, I will never turn you away. All who come to me, I will receive them and I will raise them up on the last day. Entrust yourself to Jesus. He is clear. His word is clear. Turn from your sin. Embrace him. And he says, I'll justify you. I'll accept you. I'll become your king. I'll become your Lord. I'll become your savior. And I'll never abandon you.